And so if you're listening online or you're here tonight, uh, we're here for you. That's the whole reason to be a blessing. Everything that I do as a pastor uh, for the ministry, it is because I'm there for people through the Lord to be a, an assistant, an ambassador, if you will, of the Lord's hand outstretched to the congregation, the people that God has put in our, in our fold. We're going to be turning tonight in the book of Acts chapter number 1. I got a little carried away there singing about, lost my voice, praise the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter number 1, we're going to start with verse number 1. We're going to read through to verse number 8. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand tonight. Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1 through verse number 8. up a sweat there, so I'm going to take his jacket off if you don't mind. Praise the Lord. If you're watching online, we always say this, God bless every one of you. Thank you for the time that you take to listen. Uh, no doubt we may have some folks that are watching live tonight uh, or even after the fact, and uh, we just thank you for all that are uh, part of Gray Street in, in a uh, local way or maybe even extended. We've got people that watch the service all over the United States and every once in a while from other countries. If you have it, say amen. Amen. How many wants the Lord to talk to him tonight? I just say, God, talk to me, help me, and I'm hoping that I can stir something up in it. You know, the, before I read this, let me say this. Sometimes I'm afraid that when you've been in this a whole long time, if we're not careful without us realizing that we can have an air or an attitude like I know everything. I may even know what I'm saying. Let me ask you this. How many of you that are here tonight have ever worked in a particular business and you got pretty good at it? Anybody? You got pretty good at what you did. Whether it was real estate or janitorial or you custodial or construction or whatever it might have been. Uh, whatever it might have been, you got pretty good at it. Do you realize that just the same way that it is in the natural and the job force and the career world, it can also be the same way in your spiritual life? You can go so long that you think, well, I don't need to read the Bible because I know most of it anyway. I don't need to dig deeper in the Lord because I know how he normally moves. You understand what I'm saying? And so uh, we, if we ever get to that place, we better fall down in humility before the Lord because he has a way of humbling us whenever we, whenever we get a little too prideful and full of ourselves. Can you say amen? Acts chapter number 1. We're going to look at verse number 1. We're going to read through verse 8. And this is what the Bible said. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles which he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Did everyone catch that? He said that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. I want you to notice tonight as we read this and go into this verse, there is a difference between the water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. How many of you believe that? For John truly baptized with water, but, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. John's baptism was that baptism unto repentance, that baptism of wherewith we are saved by in the beginning. But the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he said, ye shall be baptized with, with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. 
I told you I want to talk about something I feel like is on the decline and something that has been highly neglected. I want to talk to us tonight about the baptism, the genuine baptism, the genuine, anybody, call, you got that, genuine. If it, it, what is the opposite of genuine? Fake. I, I, I picked up a pocket knife one time and it said fox bone material, something, something. And I thought, fox, I've never seen that before. That must be some fancy bone material pocket knife. I got it. Guess what fox is? It's fake. It ain't the real thing. It's not genuine. So whatever is not authentic, we could say tonight, that's what we're up against. And I want you to know that what the Lord has dealt with me to talk to you about, the church, is the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost. How many of you that are here tonight can honestly say that without trying to be judgmental or critical towards another person, trying to weigh anyone else's salvation out, trying to pull out a measure and stick and rule out somebody else's salvation, how many of you feel like, i just put it that way, how many of you feel like tonight you've ever met anybody who claim to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but what you read in the Word of God, it did not line up with what they said. Anybody ever felt that way before? Like I said, I don't like to be the one to try to, to, to judge or to measure somebody's life out, but as a preacher, I have a responsibility to declare the Word of God. And whenever someone says that they are something that they're not, the Bible said, uh, uh, said a, a tree cannot, in other words, a tree's not going to put forth fruit unless it's that type of tree. And so you have to understand tonight that if you're an apple tree, you don't produce oranges. And if you're an orange tree, you don't produce peaches. Come on and say amen. So if you got the Holy Ghost, you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there should be the right kind of fruit on that tree. Can we agree with that tonight? But I want to approach this from a different angle tonight than I normally do in preaching. I'd like to approach it from more of a class setting in that we can look at it from a question and an answer perspective because a lot of times, have you ever been sitting in a church service before and you thought to yourself you'd like to ask a question but the preacher's coming down on it and it just might not feel like the right time to raise your hand and say, hey, can I say something right there? So I want, to, I want to approach it from that angle because even though some of us may know some of what I'm going to teach or talk about tonight, there are a lot of people that don't and there are some people that have forgot and there are some of us that need a refresher course so that we can have the gift of God stirred up within us tonight. Can you say God help us all? But to explain certain key important facts about the Holy Ghost... We can easily do that by looking at some of the common questions that arise and the answers to those questions. The very first question that the Holy Ghost impressed on my heart is who or what is the Holy Ghost? Who or what is the Holy Ghost? First, I want you to look at what He is not. Years ago, I heard somebody give an illustration, and they made the point. They come across with, uh, you know, we were in an epidemic, I guess you'd say, there for a few years. We're still seeing it today. But how many remember when it was almost like every time you turned the news on, somebody was printing fake money and trying to use fake money somewhere? Well, during that period of time, some, someone had, had uh, told me about a story that they had come across where that there was a person that worked in, in a banking position, if memory serves me correct. And this particular person, they, they asked them, said, what do you do? Said, do you guys have classes uh, every time that somebody releases a new type of fake money? And a new, do you have a new class to study all this new fake money so you stay on top of knowing what to do? And the comment was made by this person who not only, if memory serves me correct, was someone that also helped train other people, but they said, we don't spend much time at all dealing with or studying fake money. Said, what we do is we study the real thing so much until when we look at something fake, we don't have to study the fake, we just know what's real. Anyone understand what I'm saying? So, so sometimes you have to look and you have to say, what is the Holy Ghost? What is He not? And I can tell you, He is not an it. There have been times before that people by the slip of the tongue may say uh, it or describe or refer to the Holy Ghost as it. I want you to know He is not an it. Say amen, somebody. The Holy Ghost is not an it. 
The Holy Ghost is not a mere ghostly presence or an influence. When I grew up, how many remember Casper? We called him the friendly ghost. You remember that? You know, when I was a kid growing up, I watched the cartoons and watched a few things, episodes of that when I was just a child. But I can tell you the Holy Ghost is not just a mere ghostly presence or an influence. He is, I want you to know, the third person of the triune Godhead tonight. And I want you to consider for just just a moment, because I know that, I, and I don't have time to get into doctrinal uh, hair splitting here with people that may say, "Well, I believe in in a, a modalist or or a, a Jesus only a doctrinal belief." I don't believe that. I don't have time to get into that because that's not the direction tonight. But take for just a minute tonight and consider the portion of the Word of God that shows Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Ghost. You don't just lie to an it. I don't lie to the sheetrock on the wall. I don't lie to the seats. You lie to people. Say amen, somebody. You lie to you lie to someone or something. You're not just lying to an it. And so when we read in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 3, the Bible said, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the Lamb? How many of you understand when you read that, you begin to recognize that the Holy Ghost is not just a, a wind. It's not just a mere presence. It's not just an influential thing. But the Holy Ghost is an actual part of the Godhead. Can you say amen? I want you to know that when we look at the Godhead, we can look at it like this. Just like you have an egg. An egg has a yolk. It has a white part. It has a shell. There's three parts at least there to that egg. And you understand it's one egg, but all three parts make up that one egg. I'm not serving three gods. I'm serving one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? And I want you to look secondly, where do we see the biblical example of the Holy Ghost? In the Old Testament, we see him come upon men to empower them with great strength and ability. Do you remember Samson in the Word of God? There were men like Samson. In the Old Testament, we see the Holy Ghost come upon men and empower them through great exploits or great acts that God used them for. In the Old Testament, you see Samson takes a jawbone of a donkey and he whips a thousand men under the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe that whenever David killed Goliath when he read that sling back that the Holy Ghost got behind that and caused it to sink down into the head of that giant Goliath. So we see the power of the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. We read about the Holy Ghost empowering men like this uh, but when we get into the New Testament he, he is the Holy Ghost is primarily seen uh, as the drawing force that brings man to Christ. How many of you know tonight you cannot come to God except the Spirit draw you to the Lord? You don't just one day randomly, well, you know, I think I'll get saved today. No, what happens is the Spirit convicts the heart of a man and the Spirit draws man to God. Do you know tonight that is his job? And we see him, see him doing that in the New Testament. Once that man has accepted Christ, we see him as as the Holy Ghost as the power for the baptized believer to be baptized in, if you will, tonight. So he is the power and he is baptizing us to be effective ambassadors for Jesus. And he's not John's baptism. He is the baptism of fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost. You know tonight when I read in the Word of God and I understand that he empowers the children of God in the New Testament he baptizes us for a purpose. He doesn't baptize us just so we can say we're Pentecostal. He doesn't baptize us just so we can run and shout and that we can dance and preach hard and sing loud. He don't do that. The reason he baptized us with the Holy Ghost uh, is to make us effective witnesses and ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen to that? We also see the Holy
Holy Ghost in the New Testament as the comforter. He is that alongside help. He is that power that comes uh, along and he also indwells uh, us as a comforter. Do you know we're going to go through difficult times? Uh, I don't know that we can all say that we've been through anything like the New Testament church went through. But can you imagine being a martyr for the gospel's sake, having your body skinned uh, alive uh, or hung upside down or, or tarred and feathered and burned all night long uh, like some of the martyrs got martyred and killed for the gospel's sake? None of us that I know of have ever been through anything even close to that. But the Lord said uh, that when he went away, he said, if I don't go away, the comforter cannot come. Do you know he is that one that gives you comfort? And I want you to know that sometimes I'm afraid uh, that we say that we're baptized in the Holy Ghost uh, and we've got no comfort, no peace. Uh, I want you to know that, that he is the comfort. He is the one to be with you when you're lonely. He's the one that's supposed to give you strength whenever you're broken. And if you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, you need to pull that bottom lip up uh, and say, Lord, strengthen me through the power of the Holy Ghost. Can someone say amen to me tonight? He's not just the comforter, but he's also tonight, he is the spirit of truth. How many of you know the word of God tells us? He is the spirit of truth. That means he is the voice of truth. He is the declaration of truth. And if you say you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, and he is the spirit of truth, that means he declares truth through you as an ambassador of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? And number three, can anyone be baptized with the Holy Ghost? With emphasis on the word anyone. Can anyone be baptized with the Holy Ghost? Is it just for the Pope? Is it just for the rabbi? Is it just for the preacher? Is it just for any? Just, who's it for? Do you know that even here recently, uh, somebody made the statement and I understand what they were trying to say and I'm not trying to be critical in any way, but I want you to know Yes, the Lord does. Yes, the Holy Ghost does speak to the pastor's heart. And yes, the Holy Ghost does speak into the man of God to speak to the church, to give the church declaration and direction. But that is not where it stops. You as a child of God can hear from God. And you also hear from the man of God. It's not that you subvert the authority that God gave for through a pastor. Pastor, but God also, because the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, uh, that through the Holy Ghost, uh, if he's good enough to fill you with the Holy Ghost, uh, he can also be good enough to talk to you through the Holy Ghost. Can somebody say thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost? Can anyone, can anyone, somebody say anyone. Can anyone be baptized in the Holy Ghost? Well, that's a good question tonight. The answer is yes, but there is a clause. Can anyone be baptized with the Holy Ghost? Yes, as long as they have genuinely committed their lives to Christ and have allowed the work of sanctification to begin in their life. Do you know tonight if that vessel, the Bible talks about putting a new wine, an old vessel, said you don't do that because if you do, the bottle would burst. Uh, that vessel's got to be purged. It's got to be pure. Anybody ever done any canning before? And if that jar is not clean, guess what it'll do? It'll, bu it'll bust. But when that jar is purified, clean, uh, it's washed correctly, it'll hold the contents of that bottle that's in the bottle. And I want you to know it's the same with the Holy Ghost. Uh, you're not going to put the clean. I mean, you know, the first word in Holy Ghost is what? Say it again. Ho, ho, is that what it, holy, holy? So if you call him the Holy Ghost or maybe you call him the Holy Spirit, whatever, but it's still Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, holy. That means he is holy. You don't put the Holy Ghost uh, in a garbage can. Come on, say amen. If your mouth talks like a garbage can, if you act like a garbage can, uh, I want you to know he don't pour the Holy Ghost into that until that vessel's been purged, uh, put on the altar, and the work of sanctification has began in that life. Can somebody say, thank God, begin it in me. 
Amen. So the answer is yes, as long as you're genuinely committed to the Lord and the work of sanctification has began. You're going to hear me talk quite a bit throughout this little lesson tonight about the power of sanctification working in a person's life. Sanctification is a work of cleansing. How many of you know what sanctification means? Sanctification means I'm set apart. It means I'm separated. It is a sorting, separating, a process of prioritizing that life. Do you know that when the work of sanctification begins uh, is a purification that God does and it's a purification that you do. Sanctification is not just God's job, uh, but it is also your job. In other words, uh, if the Lord said, hey, don't be drinking no more Jack Daniels, uh, God's gonna get, he's gonna touch you, he's gonna deal with you, but it's up to you to quit going to ABC Liquor, it's up to you to quit paying for it, it's up to you to quit putting it in the refrigerator, and it's up to you to quit putting it to your lips. Uh, can somebody say, God help me? I've wondered how many times that the Lord has delivered somebody from an addiction and then they just keep doing it, keep doing it. If God delivers you from it and you keep going back and buying it, uh, pretty soon you'll be drinking it again. Somebody say amen. But you must be sanctified. That sanctifying work, it purges, it cleanses, and it separates the wheat from the chaff. It's just like that person. Whenever they're in that threshing floor, and they're taking that wheat, and they're threshing it, and they're throwing it in the air. What they're doing is they're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. And he says, God, get anything out of me that don't belong to me. If you want the power of the Holy Ghost to really work, you gotta get whatever's in there that don't belong in there. We need to get back to the day in the church uh, where we're preaching about sanctification. We've got enough worship around most churches. Uh, everybody's talking about worship. Uh, everybody wants entertainment. Uh, few want to get sanctified. Uh, but I'll tell you the one thing you can tell the difference uh, between the devil, somebody that's fake, uh, and somebody that's got the real thing. Uh, you want to know how you tell the difference? Uh, the devil cannot live a sanctified life. I said, the devil can't live a sanctified life. The Bible said where there's tongues, there's going to be false tongues. Huh? Am I right? Where there's prophecy, there'll be false prophecy. A tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass. I've always said like a bunch of pots and pans clanging together. Ping, frong, fring, fang. You understand what I'm saying? Just a bunch of noise. But when the Holy Ghost is in it, when the power of the Holy Ghost gets behind it, it makes the difference. Can somebody say, Lord, make the difference in me? Come on now. Sanctification cleanses, sorts, sorts, and separates and prioritizes. Number four, what does it mean to be baptized with the Holy Ghost? There's people that don't really understand what it means to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Well, as we have already discussed the distinction of having the Holy Ghost come upon you or having the Holy Ghost come into you, to be baptized in is similar to this. And I want you to listen very closely. You may want to write this down or jot it down on your mind because this is something that you may use years from now. I come across this years ago and it really spoke to me and I've used it ever since then. Having the Holy Ghost, being baptized in the Holy Ghost is similar to and has often been compared to the art of pickling or canning in which the object is completely submerged and kept in the solution until the canning solution becomes part of the object by working its way into the object. They become as one and the object is preserved. Did you get that? That to me was a powerful way of looking at being baptized in the Holy Ghost. When that pickle or that cucumber, that peach is dropped into that canning jar, that solution begins to work its way into that pickle and that cucumber if you will and after a while they become one because the solution and the product work their way into one another that's the way the Holy Ghost wants to work in you. He wants to be so integrated into your life and every aspect of your life that whenever there's evil and there's temptation and you're about to put your hand to it there's a great row that says no don't touch that. Don't look at that don't mess with that. Don't go there. Don't wear that. Don't 
talk about that. Don't talk about that person. Don't, you understand? Don't take that money. Don't do this or that because the greater woe and the greater no comes through the power that has integrated itself into your life. To be baptized with the fullness of the power of the Holy Ghost. To be baptized means to be completely saturated and inhabited by the Holy Ghost, not just the alongside help. Not just with me, in me. Not just to help me in troubled times, but in me. I can look back tonight and I can share my own personal experience it may be different for everybody, but I can talk about what went on in my life because I remember what happened for me. But when I prayed and asked God to fill me with the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost came in one night while I was praying in a church service. I got baptized and filled. My pastor was not standing there when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And one day, when my wife got filled with the Holy Ghost, we were coming back from the Ferndale Church of God. That's what they called it back then. They called it Spirit Life or something else now. But we were coming back from the Ferndale Church of God. My wife got baptized. My pastor must not have realized that I had gotten baptized in the Holy Ghost in a prior service. And so we were riding along. And my pastor asked me the question. He said, Brother Joe, how do you know that you got baptized in the Holy Ghost? Did you speak in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance? He said, I hadn't heard that. I said, yes, sir. I said, I sure did. The power of the Holy Ghost came in. He said, well, praise the Lord, Brother Joe. I'm glad to hear that. Do you know the thing is uh, that when the Holy Ghost comes in, uh, there's going to be a distinct difference. Uh, and I went on to tell my pastor, I said, I've noticed something different about my life. It's a different feeling that I cannot really fully put my finger on or explain. Uh, when the Holy Ghost came in and where it used to be, there would be something in front of me wrong to do. It used to be, well, you know, you shouldn't do that. But when the Holy Ghost came in, it was like a neon sign would go off. Uh, it was like a greater woe and a greater no. Uh, it was a greater self-control, a greater a voice in that in my heart that was speaking greatly to me in a strong, proficient way. And I can say, thank God that he baptized me with the Holy Ghost because I don't know if I'd be here right now tonight. Still preaching the word of God, still living like I am. But I want to tell you tonight, to be baptized means to be completely saturated and inhabited by the Holy Ghost, not just the alongside help. To be baptized is to be equipped for effective service in the kingdom of God. He said who he calls, who he equips. So what does it mean to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? It means to be equipped to do the work that God has called you to do. I want you to take a step back tonight and I want you to think about something you've probably heard me preach before. But the days of Pentecost, it marked the days of harvest. In other words, it was the beginning of harvest. In the natural, it was like a holiday in America. It was their day where it marked the beginning of a harvest naturally. Why did God use the days of Pentecost? Because I believe that the Lord was in a sense saying, you've used the day for a, a day of natural harvesting, but I'm about to start a brand new type kind of harvesting. It is the harvest of souls. And he began it on the days of Pentecost. Can somebody say thank God for that? But it happened on the days of Pentecost. And so God was equipping the saints of God. I've told you the other day when I preached uh, that if the Lord really wanted to, when he told him to go to Jerusalem and be endued with power from on high, he said to tarry there, don't depart from Jerusalem until you get the Holy Ghost. He could have easily, he's God, he could have easily looked at him and said, be you filled with the Holy Ghost and bam, it would have happened. But there's a process that they had to go through and they had to tarry and wait until the Holy Ghost came. I want to tell you that one of the reasons that I believe that was is because the Bible said the Holy Ghost, it is that gift that to them that obey, to them that obey. How many of you know the Word of God tells us that the Holy Ghost is to them that obey? And I want you to know you got people walking in disobedience that claim to have the Holy Ghost. They need to really get back down on the altar and do a spiritual audit between them and God. But God equips them. God was about to send them out 
And he said, the works that I do, you'll do greater works. Some people get it confused and they think, we're going to do better than Jesus. Well, no, here's the thing. We are many. The Lord was only one man walking the shores of Galilee. One man, amen, in ships and one man in temples. Uh, one man in city streets like uh, uh, Capernaum and places. But he says, I want you to understand, like the uh, network marketing program, if you could put it that way, there will be multitudes upon multitudes of people who are going to do the mighty acts of God and if you multiply them we will do more exploits because there will be more of us with the spirit of God in us in the world that God's name could be glorified and God had to equip the church he knew he had to and that's why that he filled them with the Holy Ghost I want you to understand that it is necessary it is needful that we be filled with the Holy Ghost. We have got to see churches getting back to the day we're preaching that people need the Holy Ghost because people come in and they're so casual about it. They don't care if they have the Holy Ghost. And a lot of folks, they don't even really understand fully. We need to see people demonstrating the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit through the Holy Ghost, the world that is coming up, our children that are coming up when we become so dry, dead, and formal that when we come to church that there's no power in our life at all. Do you know that that is contrary to the Word of God? because he said you shall be endued with not a dead dry church experience I need the power my grandchildren need to see the power of God in me the, my family needs to see the world needs to see the power of the Holy Ghost operating in the church again and I'm to the place I say God if I have failed you and I began to just kind of go casually about it God let me burn like a hot ember off the altars of God once again somebody say amen so to be baptized, it means to be completely submerged and saturated, and it also means to be equipped for effective service in the kingdom of God. And for a leader, it is to lead by the Spirit. So what does it mean to be baptized with the Holy Ghost? Well, for a leader, it is to be lead, led by and to be able to lead by the Spirit. It is imperative that every person that claims to be a leader in the church, especially those who minister in the Word, preachers and teachers, that they be filled with the Holy Ghost. I had somebody ask me some years ago. I was in a revival preaching as an evangelist. And they said, Pastor Myers, they said, if you were pastoring, they called me evangelist back then, it was evangelist or whatever, Brother Myers, if you were pastoring and you had a Sunday school teacher, adult Sunday school teacher, would you expect them to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And uh, I didn't know this then, but it was a trick question to get me some pulled in some drama they were having in their church, and I had no idea. You learn wisdom over the years. But this is what I told them. I said, as a pastor... I would not want somebody trying to tell other people about the Holy Ghost, how to receive the Holy Ghost, and everything about everything that has to do with the Holy Ghost, and yet they don't have the Holy Ghost. They haven't been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said, I believe that it's imperative that if we're going to lead a flock, if we're going to lead a church, that we must be led by the Spirit. And if it was good enough for Him to send them to the upper room to get it before they went out and ministered for Him, it's good enough. Come on now, say amen. It's good enough for me. If I'm going to do a homeless ministry, I need the Holy Ghost. Before I go to the nursing home, I need the Holy Ghost. Before I work with youth, I need the Holy Ghost. Before I preach or pastor a church, I need the Holy Ghost. If I'm going to teach the little children in the children's church class, I need the Holy Ghost. Years ago, one old-fashioned preacher said, I believe you need the Holy Ghost to take up an offering. Praise God. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. We need the Holy Ghost. Say amen, somebody. For, so for a leader, it's to be led by the Spirit. And number five, is there anything that can prevent us from receiving the Holy Ghost? Because there are people that are seeking, some that are asking God to baptize them for the Holy Ghost. Is there anything that will keep me from getting the Holy Ghost? I'll tell you, first of all, it goes without saying that first you must be saved. One man came to him and wanted the power of the Holy Ghost. He wanted to pay for it. I'll buy it. What will it cost me? 
that's not how it works. That's not how it works, friend. You must be first born again. Or if you're from Kentucky or up in the woods somewhere, born again. Say amen. You got to be born again. You got to have repented of your sins, accepted Jesus as a full pardon for your sins. And I'll tell you tonight that once a man is saved, it opens up the door for you to be baptized. And secondly, if there's anything else that will keep us from the Holy Ghost, it is carnality and disobedience. Do you know there are some people that are so carnally minded, their taste buds are for the things of ungodliness and things of the world. Do you know what salvation and the work of sanctification begins to do? It begins to change your spiritual salivary glands and your taste buds. You don't want the things you used to want. Come on now, the work of sanctification will take the want to out of you. I don't want to drink Michelob light. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I've been sanctified. Holy, can somebody say amen? I don't want to do what I used to do because the Holy Ghost is working in my life. Amen. Carnality and disobedience. If the Holy Ghost is to them that obey, disobedience will keep you from the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you tonight, I also believe that disobedience can cause you to lose the Holy Ghost. That's what I believe. After all, the Holy Ghost is given to them with, that, that obey. A lack of genuine commitment and sincerity will pre- prevent us from receiving the Holy Ghost. I've been in churches before, and so has my son, where there'd be a youth, youth camp. Anybody ever been to a youth camp? Uh, there's probably enough wildfire in a youth camp to set every church in America on fire. You know what I mean? Kids that Sometimes they, they don't have no intention of really getting in and getting what they need. They're just showing out. I've seen plenty of that. I'm not telling you it's always that way, but I've seen a, a little bit of that. You've been around the church. You've seen what we call wildfire. Matter of fact, I was passing down the street the other day here in Apopka and passed a church, and they named the church wildfire. I thought, Lord, have mercy. I'd never name my church wildfire. Praise God. Strange. That's wild. Anyway. But there's enough wildfire there. And if you've ever been to a youth camp, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the the thing is tonight that there are people that are not sincere about seeking the Holy Ghost. They go up to the altar. They got one eye half cracked and the other one half open. And you got people praying and trying to pray them through the Holy Ghost. And they're wearing their self out while they're just standing there. They got no intention of, they got no intention of their life being clean. They got no intention of getting rid of their, their little pornography they do on their little internet their phones and tablets and what they got no intention of telling that little girl they can't keep doing the things they've been doing in the closet in the dark or whatever they got no intention to do that but fill me with the Holy Ghost Uh, let me tell you you've got to be sincere in your approach if you want God to do something in you you can't come foolishly amen like a foolish man before God because God can see down inside of you and see things that a CAT scan and an MRI cannot see God knows our intention can you say amen I'll tell you tonight, that lack of genuine commitment and sincerity, it will prevent us from receiving the Holy Ghost. A lack of submission to Christ, His will, His word, His authority in your life. In other words, rebellion will prevent you from receiving the Holy Ghost. You cannot walk and live in rebellion and expect to get or keep the Holy Ghost. The Bible said that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's pretty serious stuff. When God says you're rebelling against me, my wife tells a story about how that many years ago we lived in a little single wide mobile home over in Claremont, Florida, and she got aggravated about a situation that was going on. I don't have time to explain the whole thing, but she said that she felt like the Holy Ghost just left, and she said it was the weirdest, strangest feeling. She said she began to cry and beg God, please, please, Please don't leave me. I want you to know something. When he said in his word, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That is a that is contingent upon the very fact that your life, you want him there. But when you bring disobedience in, you put so much trash in there, there's no room for God in your life. Amen. It's the same way when you accept Christ, you ask him into your life. When you keep putting stuff in there, you are pushing him out the door. Come on now. I want you to know that whenever you continue to put more more and more garbage in. The Bible said bitter water and sweet water cannot come from the same fountain. You're not going to cuss and use all manner of foul language and cuss everybody out and then go to church and speak in tongues. It don't work that way. Come on now. It ain't popular, but praise God anyhow. 
I want to tell you the lack of submission to Christ, His will, His word, His authority in your life. In other words, rebellion will prevent you from receiving the Holy Ghost. And is there anything that can prevent us from receiving the Holy Ghost? What prevents you from receiving the Holy Ghost can, can also cause you to lose the Holy Ghost. An example tonight, operating in the works of the flesh. When you begin to operate into the, in the works of the flesh, and you're not allowing, you're not walking in the Spirit, you are putting yourself in very great danger of either, either not being able to receive the Holy Ghost or keeping the Holy Ghost. I believe that that's one of the reasons possibly that we see people being refilled with the Holy Ghost. I'm not sure. I can't say 100%. I have to wait till I get to heaven and ask the Lord that I suppose. But I can tell you this much. There are people right now that one time had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it has been 25, 30 years since they've really had the power, saturating power over their life. And they're still, as one preacher saying, doing the same old halala and shikabosha they did 40 years ago. And they still ain't got no power in it than it did way back when. And some of them tell you something, you can do something so long that the power's not in it. I want you to know you need a fresh brand, you need a fresh experience in the Lord every day. What are you saying, Pastor Myers? What I'm saying is, is that I've got the altar before and I've heard people just dee, 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 dee. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, it just feels like a bucket of cold ice water pulled all over me. If the Holy Ghost is not in it, man, I wouldn't even want to attempt to try to emulate the Holy Ghost if it's not really there. If you're not living with the fire every day, you need to get back down in that altar. Put some more fire in the altar between you and God and let the Holy Ghost rise up within you. Can you say amen? Man, when you got to get down in prayer and push the Holy Ghost out, that ain't the way it works. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost, when He's in there, He gives the utterance. Uh, you don't have to try to force it. It just comes. Come on now. Amen. How many knows the difference? How many knows what I'm saying tonight? Amen. Um, some of you may not fully come, understand or comprehend where I'm coming from, but you have to realize I've been in a lot of church services since I've been saved. I have seen a lot of foolishness in the time I've been saved. I've heard people giving out messages that were not of God, saying things that made absolutely no sense, prophesying and laying hands on people, and then you find out three or four days later that person's shacking up with somebody living in adultery or fornication, and yet they're giving out, uh, they're going to give, give gifts and whatever out to people and whatnot. It don't work like that. I said, it don't work like that. How can you tell if you have the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost? How can you tell if you have the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost? How many of you here tonight said, I want the real thing. I don't want no fake. I don't want no phony. I don't want to settle for nothing else. I want the real Holy Ghost in me. Listen. First of all, you can tell because speaking fluently in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance is the initial. Somebody say initial. Initial evidence of the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost, first of all. Some people base their whole experience on whether they have the Holy Ghost on tongues. I believe that is a big misconception. The initial evidence that whenever you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, I believe you will speak in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. But if your whole experience is based on that, and that's how you think you have the genuine Holy Ghost, you might want to keep praying, God, I don't want to miss the mark. I want you to know, I believe uh, that when a man gets fully baptized in the Holy Ghost, not only will the evidence be there, but you'll also feel it. I know we can't go uh, solely by feeling because there are some people that feel things wrong, but I do believe you will feel it. I don't believe it's just going to be an empty sensation and you walk away going, hmm, I wonder if I got filled with the Holy Ghost tonight. I don't think it works that way. I mean, for me, I can testify myself the way it was for me, and I can tell you that when the Holy Ghost came in, I knew, I knew there was something different. I felt it. I felt the power of the Holy Ghost all over me. I knew there was a, a regenerating fire inside of me. But it is the, the speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost. I heard one, I think it was Sister Linda Botman that said one time, if you ever remember the tea kettle that you put on the stove and you heat it up 
and it whistles. Anybody remember that? You don't see that much anymore. Now we got Keurigs and all kinds of other methods to heat up water. But back in the day, they'd put a, a tea kettle or whatever on the stove, fill it full of water, and when it was red, it was boiling, it would start whistling. See, that whistle is an outward sign of an inward experience. When that thing starts whistling, you're in the other room and you're going, yep, it's boiling over. Let me tell you, whenever you're around somebody full of the Holy Ghost, it's going to start whistling. You're going to hear it. You're going to know it because it is an outward sign of an inward experience. The power is there. And if you try to contain it, it's not going to work because just like Jeremiah said, can you imagine a man that wasn't even filled with the Holy Ghost? He says, it's like fire shut up in my bones. What should it be like for those filled with the Holy Ghost tonight? Amen, somebody. But how can you tell? Secondly, a life that is set apart. Fruit, meat for repentance. If you have not gotten past the first stages of repentance and you're still living in adultery, fornication, lust of the eye, the pride of life, and all of these things, you may want to get back down in the altar and say, refill me if you've been filled before, or say, God, get this stuff out of my life that I can be filled tonight. You see, you can know, because when you start living ungodly, you might have had the Holy Ghost 15 years ago, but what's come between you and God since then? What have you allowed to become more important in your life than God? I believe the Holy Ghost go to church. I believe the Holy Ghost will go to church. I believe the Holy Ghost will, will say, no, we can't. That's nasty. I ain't looking at that magazine. That's nasty. I believe the Holy Ghost would say that. These people that tell me, well, I've just been hurt by this and hurt by that, and I'm just going to serve God from home. I believe if you tell me you got the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost wants to go to church and fellowship with the rest of the bride. I just got to believe that. I believe the Holy Ghost is faithful. Well, pastor, I, I just, I don't know. I got money for Big Gulp and Smoky Big Bite, and I got money for going down to the grocery store and getting me a pack of bubble gum and what have you, but I ain't got no money to give to the church. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll play the piano for you. I'll get up and sing for you. Let me tell you, your gifts and talents were given to you to be a blessing, but the money that has been given into your hands uh, has also been given to be a blessing, and we must, must, someone say we must be obedient in all areas of our life. I believe the Holy Ghost would pay tithes. I believe the Holy Ghost would give an offering. Come on now. Say amen. The fruit of the Spirit tonight. I, I will say this. It is a life that is set apart. Fruit, meat for repentance. The fruit of the Spirit in fluid operation. I believe that's one way you'll know whether you got the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost is when the fruit of the Spirit is in fluid operation in your life. Uh, next, I believe that power, power, power you'll know whether or not you have the genuine Holy Ghost. If it's just speaking in tongues and no power, well, you miss the whole point. He said, when you go to Jerusalem, I want you to tarry there until you, and he didn't say until you start speaking in tongues. He said, until you be endued with power. Well, what kind of power are we talking about? Are we talking about 93 octane pastors that we're talking about? Unleaded, ethanol free? Is that what we're racing fuel? That's the kind of power we're talking about? Are we talking about 600 horsepower engines? Is that the kind of power we're talking about? Bench pressing 1,000 pounds? Is that the kind of power we're talking about? No, sir. This power for us to live right Power to proclaim the gospel when he said you shall be witnesses and power to sustain. In other words, keeping power. People that are on this roller coaster, this week they're going to serve God. Next week they don't know what they want to do. This week they're going to they're gonna be in, hooked up in a relationship out of wedlock with somebody they shouldn't even be with, going to stay out of church for three months, and then whenever that person gets on their nerves, they're going to dump them and come back to church for two weeks or three days. Let me tell you something. That roller coaster does not show your real love for God. What that shows is you're not really committed. Let me tell you, you wouldn't want to be married to somebody that loved you sometimes and sometimes they didn't. Come on now. You want somebody that's going to be faithful to that marriage, and that's the same way that 
it is with the Lord. Uh, he gives you the power through the Holy Ghost for you to live right. Uh, he gives you the power to proclaim the gospel. Oh, Lord, I'm shy. I'm backwards. Well, when you get the Holy Ghost, you might still be kind of quiet, but you, you're going to have power to witness. Power. Power. Somebody say power. Power to sustain. You're not going to be up today and down tomorrow. You're not going to ride a roller coaster. You're still going to serve the Lord. Not every little thing that blows you over. Sustaining power to keep you in the fight. Oh, Lord, help me. Your lifestyle. How will I know I have the genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost? Your lifestyle will resemble the characteristics of biblical proportions. When you read the New Testament... And you see the way they live. You see the dedication, the consecration, the separation, and the sanctification. Your life should resemble that. Your lifestyle will resemble the characteristics of biblical proportions. It wasn't that long ago. I'm going to hit this while I'm already here. I had a relative that told me that they work with somebody. That every time they turn around, they're cussing, cussing this, and cussing that one out. Everybody is cussing about everything. And then a little while later, you'll hear them listening to gospel music and trying to preach to everybody. And it got on their nerves. So they questioned the person about it. And so that person justified their cussing by saying, well, in the Bible, even Peter cussed. Well, the Bible says that Peter cussed. I don't know what kind of words he was using. And let's just say that he was using similar words to we know in our cuss word language in America, which I doubt. But anyway, let's say if that was the case. So what you're telling me is you're going to use a man that fell as your means of justification. Instead, that, that would be like me saying, well, David loved the Lord with his whole heart and he slept with Bathsheba so I can sleep around with women. I can watch women through the lattice. I can watch women through the curtains because David did it. Don't use a man's failure as your means of justification. What did, what did Peter do? Yeah, Peter messed up. Peter failed miserably. He denied the Lord, and the Bible tells us that he went on a cussing spree, I guess. I don't know exactly what he said because I wasn't there. But nonetheless, Peter prayed through. Peter got it. Peter repented and got right, got filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't, you, don't use that as a means to justify doing the wrong thing. Come on and say amen. Your lifestyle will resemble the characteristics of biblical proportion, a continuation of daily sanctification, which is taking up the cross daily. It is a daily crucifying of the flesh. I want you to know that also a, continu of a continuation of daily sanctification, an urgent desire to do what is right, regardless of whether it may cost you money, job, friends, family, or popularity and reputation. How do I know whether I got the Holy Ghost, genuine Holy Ghost? Well, I'll tell you what. If you choose your job over God, if you choose your family over God, if you choose your popularity and reputation over the call of God, you'll have to take it up with God, I suppose. But I would say you better find an altar and really pray and seek the Lord. How can you tell if you don't have the genuine Holy Ghost? Now, I've some of you may think, well, Pastor Myers, we just talked about how do you know whether you have a genuine Holy Ghost, so it may seem like a given question or given answer based on what we've already talked about. But I want to go through a list of things right here before I get ready to close. I hope I haven't preached us to death tonight. But what, how do I know, how, how, how could you tell if you don't have the Holy Ghost? Well, a lack of sanctification might be a very good indicator. If your walk ain't right, your talk ain't right, your act ain't right, your attitude ain't right. So, Pastor, anybody can fail. I'm not talking about somebody who falls in the altar and prays and is in a daily crucifying. I'm talking about somebody who is willfully involved in sin with no regard to whether God cares or anybody else. How do I know a lack of tongues? How do I know a lack of obedience to all scriptural commands, including the support of ministry? 
people that tell me that they have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but they do not support the church. They don't support the ministry. They don't support leadership. They don't support anything but them. I have a very hard time believing they're really baptized in the Holy Ghost because like I said earlier, the Holy Ghost that is in you, He is going to make sure the church is taken care of. When you got money to go to the movie theater but you can't give to missions, when you got money for every other fan, uh, 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 fanfare, hobby, and everything else, but you got no money to help take care of the needs around the church, I want you to know, you might want to do a checkup because the Holy Ghost supports the ministry and He supports the church. A lack of power, if there's no power in your life, power to live right, talk right, power to witness, power in, in, in God, you might want to look, you may want to go back to the altar. A lack of self-control, this is something that you may have heard me preach before, but I stand wholeheartedly on this. I feel like this is something that the Lord showed me many years ago. In the Word of God, you know that the Bible tells us that the tongue no man can tame. You know what it says? It talks about the ships and the little helm in the back of the ship that turn the ship. It talks about the bridle in the horse's mouth and all of that. How you just, you know, with a little bit of turn, you know, you can do that. But no man, it's like, a, it's like a, a deadly viper, a deadly poison, like a viper. You know what I'm saying? So we all agree tonight that the Bible does in fact talk about the tongue that no man. Somebody say no man. No man. But guess who can? No man can tame that tongue, but guess who can? Now, this is what I believe. I believe that one of the reasons why that the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost is, the, is speaking in tongues is because it is a sign, a symbol that the Holy Ghost has taken. The one member of your body that you have no control over, that one member that you cannot, you cannot tame, and he says, I got it. Before that tongue can speak with the tongue of angels, before that tongue can speak of the heavenly language, I believe tonight that that soul must be filled with the Holy Ghost. I also believe that when, that when that power comes in, He takes control of that tongue. I want you to see tonight that if, you, if you're living in error to God's Word, then there's no way. I don't see how in this world you're living in the error of God's Word, and yet you have God the Holy Ghost inside of you, the one that directs, the one that guides, the one that leads, but you're living in error to God's Word. It's time to get down and pray. A lack of fruit or the evidence of a strong witness, a lack of desire for a deeper experience in pursuit of the nine gifts of the Spirit. When you have somebody that has absolutely no appetite, when the Holy Ghost comes in, He is that power that helps us, motivates us to have a spiritual appetite. When you have no desire to go to church, you have no desire to be in the power of God's presence. How many of you remember the way you felt when you first got saved? How many of you remember when you first got into the church? You couldn't wait to get to church. You couldn't wait to be in the middle of a service where the power of God was moving. You couldn't wait to pray for somebody in the altar. You couldn't wait to pray with somebody that needed the Holy Ghost. You couldn't wait to get up and sing. You couldn't wait to get, be used by God in whatever way that He used you. Because there is a passion and there is a hunger and an appetite within you. When the Holy Ghost uh, comes into you, you want to be in revival. People that say, well, I'm, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but you don't go support your church when your church is in revival and there's no reason why you can't. You're not physically handicapped. You're not broke. And you can't go to revival. And you tell me you got the Holy Ghost. A lack of boldness. Because the Holy Ghost brings boldness. Some people are too timid to even proclaim the goodness of God. If the Holy Ghost didn't do anything at all, He will give you the ability to speak to those who need to hear the gospel. Well, I'm a little shy. The Holy Ghost will take care of that. The Holy Ghost will give you the words to say, give you power and boldness to speak with proficiency the words of God. Not only that, you say the, the lack of the, the, the way that you react to circumstances that are not in your favor. You ever want to know, you really, really, really want to know what is at the heart of every one of us? Watch how people react to circumstances that are not in their favor. Just watch. And that is something we can all learn from. Because when we're leaning on the flesh and we're not leaning on the Spirit to guide us, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. The lack... This is, there's two other things, a lack of modesty. 
And this is something that you don't hear a lot of because people always think you're trying to close line, preach everybody. Let me tell you something. You're walking around half naked and half dressed and tell me you got the Holy Ghost. I believe the Holy Ghost, if the Holy Ghost is in you, will tell you to put some clothes on. Whenever you're out there advertising and, and every man in the church has got to look the other way because when you bend over, everything's hanging out. Let me tell you something. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will tell you when you grab that junk out of the closet, you say, well, that's all I got to wear. Well, you do what you got to do. That's between you and God, but that's all you got to do. Thank God I'm glad you come to church. But as soon as you get a little bit of money, honey, I'm hoping you put a little bit more clothes on because the Holy Ghost will tell you, don't let that hang out because you're causing a stumbling block for somebody else it's the truth it's a fact it's the way that it is a lack of modesty you tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you're trying to be seductive the Holy Ghost ain't trying to lure no man the Holy Ghost ain't trying to lure no woman a lack of holiness of heart and lifestyle a holiness lifestyle is a lifestyle of purity of separation of doing your best to abstain from the very appearance of evil. Holy. You have the Holy Ghost. You have a Holy Bible. You serve a Holy God. We're planning to go to a Holy Heaven. I think that we ought to be. I think we ought to live. I think we ought to have a lifestyle of being holy. Say amen, somebody. Stand to your feet across the house, if you will. Hopefully I hadn't preached too long tonight. I've just done my best to Share the Word of God with us. We need a refresher course tonight to be reminded. We all need to stir up the gift of God that's in us. We need to get in the altar and say, Lord, fill me and refill me with the Holy Ghost tonight. Because I want to be effective. God did not just give us the baptism of the Holy Ghost to just be a quiet boy sitting on a pew, but to proclaim the Lord's gospel everywhere and every chance that we get because that is the commission of the church. Amen. Let's find ourselves a place tonight and let's seek the Lord in prayer.